So, uh, David Black is here to deliver our final keynote, and I'm really happy to have him, so enjoy. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here, and um, I just, I guess there's a kind of official close down thing, uh, you know, tear down thing after my talk, but I just want to thank Jeremy and all of his um, co organizers for all the work they've done for this event, which has been really, really good. And I'm sure, Jeremy, you'll mention names maybe later if I don't remember them. But, but anyway, the point is, we've had a great time. And the food has been excellent, copious, and excellent. <laughs> um, I'm David Black. I am the director of Ruby Power and Light, um, a company that I started in 2006. It's basically a Ruby and Rails consultancy. and. Um, I do a lot of training and, and consulting and writing and so on. And I mainly founded the company and um, left my previous career in academics because the name Ruby Power and Light is so cool. And so I felt that it just it was too good to miss. Um, I'm also one of the directors of Ruby Central, which is the nonprofit organization that brings you RubyConf and that co-produces RailsConf and RailsConf Europe with um, O'Reilly. And we also, we also do other things. We have regional conference grants and, and so forth. Um, and we've been around. We were, Ruby Central was formed actually in the aftermath of the, the first RubyConf in 2001. And I thought I would talk to you today about Ruby. I mean, this is a little bit of a romp through some things about Ruby's old and new. Um, the Dickensian reference is really uh, that I'm looking at ghosts of Ruby, past, present, and future. They're friendly ghosts. This is not supposed to be a kind of you know solemn or eerie experience, right? Um, and it's not very Dickensian. I mean, I you know if I were better at finding illustrations, I'd have sort of you know what was it George Cruikshank or whatever you know illustrations from David Copperfield and stuff. I don't. It's very you know kind of. Uh, bare bones in those terms. But I thought about this kind of past, present, and future Ruby because there's so much talk nowadays about um, future Ruby and present Ruby um, and sort of where that's going. And as you know, there's a lot of different implementations of Ruby. There's also a lot of different versions of Ruby. And I'm actually going to be talking today mostly about different versions of Ruby and just to give you a very rough timeline, I know that nobody in this room is, you know, of of the conviction that uh, Ruby was extracted from Rails or something like that. I mean, you know, we we're all hip to the fact that Ruby has been around for a while. And again, very rough, but just you know, back to 1994, I think it was February February something is what Matt's calls Ruby's birthday. Um, 1.0, it gets a little kind of hard to to pin down um, 1.0 seems to have been released, you know, various versions of it um, during those two years and so forth. Just a few kind of highlights. I actually managed to um, to get Ruby 1.0 to compile recently. I just thought it would be fun to, you can actually get the FTP, you know, the, the tarball from the Ruby FTP site. And it doesn't, if you're using a recent GCC, it does not compile until you sort of stalk and slash it a little bit and you know comment out some of the the things that don't compile these <laughs> that's how you do it right that's how, yeah so you comment out and delete stuff and eventually it get it does compile um, if anybody wants my my hacked version of it I'd be happy to share it with you now it was really interesting to me because I I started using Ruby in late 2000 I am a pickaxe baby which is to say I discovered the pickaxe book really about, I think, within about a week of its appearance, um, i.e., beginning of November of 2000. And you know, I'd been doing a lot of Perl and stuff, and I saw this book, Programming Ruby, on the shelf at Borders, the late lamented Borders near my house. Um, I took the book off the shelf and opened it, and you know, basically kind of walked like this to the cash register. I just, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't take my eyes off. I just thought, this is so great. So that was late 2000. So um, just in the timeline, I'm around, um, you know, 1.6.2 or something like that. 
Um, now, Ruby 1.0, therefore, you know, kind of predates me, certainly, but I, I did want to see what it was like. And I found some, I think, very interesting things. Certain things you, you couldn't do. I mean, obviously, it's, you know, it's an early release, but certain things that where I thought I was kind of on fairly safe territory, you know, Ruby dash E put S hello world, undefined method put S. Whoops, OK. So you can't do put S. Um, you can't do, you can do each, you can't do map. Actually, it's a little misleading because there was collect. So, oh no, actually it's not misleading because I, I also put collect there. Um, I, then I thought, okay, well, I'll get systematic about this. What methods does an array have? So I said a dot methods, and that was an unknown method. So <laughs> it's a little bit out of luck. Um, and true was not true as we know it. True was uh, capitalized, and I don't know the history of that, but I, I somehow surmised that. I'm not sure how I figured that one out. Um, but the cool thing is that as of Ruby 1.0, despite the lack of put s and, and methods and so on, Ruby was already Ruby. And this is what I love about it, that you, you, know, you couldn't do put s, but you could do this. You could get into the singleton class of an object and teach the object to be different from the class that it was born from. And that, of course, is the heart of Ruby, if, if anything is. Um, so you could do that. And here, you know, I, I teach my object to, to print hi when I tell it x. And so I say x, and so on, and it says hi. Um, just another example, I mean, it's kind of the same idea, but just here. Um, over there, I have a module, and I have a, an extendees um, uh, attribute. and off I go, um, essentially extending another module with, or actually, extend, sorry, extending an object with this, um, this module. And there again, you see down in the bottom left, this is really all one little program just in two columns. But in the bottom left, you see self extend object. And again, you have that, that hook um, that you can use. And it, it, it's almost like the, the meta programming stuff is historically more fundamental to Ruby than, than some of the programming stuff, so to speak. Now, I decided to go a little further in uh, Ruby 1.0 and look at the deck of cards. Now, I use deck of cards examples in training and so forth a fair amount, because actually decks of cards are, you know, they, they're kind of good to just flush out some interesting things involving dealing with collections and so on. So here, you know, just again, a couple of things, you know, I have here um, include comparable. So we had comparable already. And as you know, if you include comparable and if you define the spaceship operator, then um, you get greater than and less than and greater than and less or greater than or equal to and so forth and, and between and so on um, for free. And the way I compare two cards with each other is basically to say, where it, I have a suits array and a ranks array, and where in the ranks array does this card occur, and where in the ranks array does the other card occur? Um, but you know, just a couple. Again, it's you know, if it, it, it's not dramatically different from what we'd write today. There's no percent %w shorthand for the array of strings. There's no atra accessor. There's this atra suit true, which. It's interesting that that was there then. I've, I've always disliked strongly the, there's a handful of these Boolean second arguments in Ruby, like instance methods, or just arguments, something. Instance methods false. You know, string dot instance methods false. What it actually means is show me all the instance methods defined in this class or module but not the ones that it gets from its ancestors, just the ones that are actually defined in it. Why that's a state of falsehood, I don't know. And it's a, I mean, you know, this true actually means create a writer attribute along with a reader attribute. Um, I'm not a fan of those, I think, somewhat cryptic Boolean arguments. But anyway, there it is. And again, it's the capitalized true. And um, here for the, de oh, sorry, that was the, the, I've got a playing cards module card class and then a deck class. And again, just a few things like in cards, um, I basically my, my basic strategy is to have an array in an instance variable called cards. And most of the, you know, dealing and shuffling and so on really is, is punted from the deck object to its cards object. And, um, 
I don't think there is any percent block thing. I mean, to, to implement each for my deck, I believe I had to do this kind, kind of the long way. I couldn't find a, a shorter way. Um, today, you could do it by capturing the block and then then kind of gluing the percent block to the to the new each. I mean, there's also, of course, a million other ways to, to delegate methods. Um, but that wasn't there. There's no shuffle, but that's a little bit of a you know, a little misleading because there's no shuffle until 1.9 anyway in the array class, but I wrote my little uh, shuffle thing. Now, the way I shuffle is to sort the cards randomly. I, I The usual idiom would be just rand, spaceship, rand. I was getting um, wrong number of method arguments zero for one with that. Apparently, you had to do rand something. I, I And I just chose three it's probably, that's probably wrong, isn't it? No, that's, I can't, I don't know. Anyway, it may, the, the, the algorithm may be wrong, but the idea is basically that um, you had to give it an argument and you couldn't just say rand. And I have a nice deal method and a sort of stupid peak method which shows you the next card without actually dealing it and so forth. Um, so this is just, you know, it's show, just a couple of things. You know, I shuffle the deck, I peek at the deck, I deal five cards, uh, I look at the hand. It's a little hard to, to kind of parse here, but basically the first line is just the card I peeked at. The next five lines are actually an array of all the playing card objects. Um, and then I just check the deck size at the end, and sure enough, it's down to 47. So again, just kind of interesting little discoveries, I think, just kind of playing around with, with 1.0. Um, and again, what most interesting to me was that there's kind of a scattering of things you can't do that you might think of as kind of the bread and butter of Ruby, you know, like put ass and methods and stuff. But other things that you can do, like opening up singles in classes, that to me it's very interesting to see that that was just you know there from the very beginning. That really is kind of the the um, foundation, you know, that that kind of technique and, and architecture are really the foundational ones. Um, so moving from the past to the present, and the in Ruby versions, the present and future are a little bit hard to tease apart. Um, and we'll look at that a bit. I, w I thought it would be interesting to look at some of the um, versions that are that are now available, some of the kind of recent developments in, in some of the versions. And I don't know how many of you kind of follow the, the ongoing uh, release cycles and so forth and some of the discussions on Ruby Core and Ruby Talk. But we're actually at an interesting point in um, I think in the history of Ruby versions and, and Ruby versioning, we have 1.8.6. How many of you run 1.8.6 as your, you know, just sort of your Ruby thing? And, and um, how many of the ones that didn't raise your hands, how many of you are running not the Matt's Ruby interpreter, but JRuby or something? Hmm. Yeah, OK. How many of you use? 187. What's it like? <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, I, 187, I'm actually kind of interested in, in what people find with 187. 187, I mean, 186 has been around for a while and, you know, is reasonably stable, although I, there were a month or so ago, there were some security patches and so on. But I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of neither here nor there in the long run. But um, 187, is basically a backport of a lot of 1.9 features to 1.86. I mean, it's 1.86 plus a lot of 1.9 stuff. Um, I, yeah, it's a little bit maybe unfair to say not gaining traction, although I, I kind of don't think it is. I mean, I think a, a lot of people, including me, feel that 1.87 is a little bit kind of neither here nor there. I mean, it doesn't really it isn't really 1.9. Um, the purpose of it is to help you migrate to 1.9. I, I don't feel the need for that. I feel like when, when and if I want to go to 1.9, I just will when it's sort of ready. So, so I, I mean, I have, I think actually Preview 2 or something of 187 installed, and I've seen, you know, I've seen it and so on, but I don't actually use it in practice. Um, 
How many of you have 1.9 of some version as your kind of day-to-day -day Ruby? How many of you have it installed and have played around with it and stuff? Some, okay. Um, 1.9, it's actually incredibly difficult to get a fix on the question of whether 1.9 is really a kind of release, you know, kind of production release, or whether 1.9 anything is gonna be a production release. Whether, I mean, originally I think we all thought it was just a development release toward 2.0. It feels to me more like 1.9.1 is going to be production-ish, I think. Um, but like I said, I, I've actually had some trouble getting a fix on that. But it's something, you know, it's not, it's not for lack of people um, working on it and so on. And we'll, I think we'll find out more. Now, I'm going to talk about the future. But actually, this is, as I said, the, the present and the future kind of slip into each other. And, in this case, I'm really going to talk about 1.9 mostly, and because um, 2.0 is you know is is way in the future, and I don't, I actually don't really know when it's I mean I have no idea when it's going to exist or exactly how it's going to relate to 1.9. Um, so one I think of 1.9 is kind of the present, but also the stuff that you do in 1.9 that's different from 1.8 is definitely Ruby of the future-ish. I mean, it's, it, the stuff is there because it's going to be there in, in 2.0 and so forth. So it's, I think, reasonable to look at 1.9 as, as a harbinger of the future. And again, I, I, I think the jury's out on whether 1.9 itself is going to sort of take root as a production um, um, release in, at some point. But, but it's certainly, you know, it's the sort of post 1.8 world now, I wanted to go into actually some, you know, some pretty specific technical things and, you know, partly just for the fun of seeing some of them. Um, some of them may be things that, that you've seen before or, or you haven't. Um, I'll probably, if you haven't seen some of this stuff, I'll probably be, you know, to some extent, in, in some cases, showing you more than you're going to sort of, you know, memorize on the spot or whatever, but still just kind of, you know, just have a look at it, and it'll give you, I think, some signposts as you look yourself at 1.9 and onward later. Um, and these are the five things that I want to talk about, uh, the new enumerable methods. I want to talk about enumerators, which I think are really key. Um, a, something called basic object, the lambda literal constructor, the otherwise known as the, the stab, what is it, the stab, stabby thing. Anyway, you'll see. Um, and block variable scoping. Now, new enumerable methods, basically, and again, you don't, I'm not expecting you to memorize this, obviously. But you know, I did this partly as kind of notes to self and, and decided to have it as a slide. But um, what you see on the left is basically a list of methods that are in enumerable for in the enumerable module for 1.9 that, that are not there in 1.8. So those are all new. A couple of them are aliases of things that were there already, um, but a lot of them are not. And what you're seeing is a lot of new kind of um, functional ways to program collections, like um, you know each cons, for example, the, the fifth one on the list, where if you have an array and you say each cons n, um, well, actually, without an n, I think it defaults to two. I, I hope so, or my example's wrong. But you can say each const three or whatever. And it will, it will move across the collection, kind of looking at get, or yielding to you a, a sub-collection consisting of that many elements and moving one at a time. So if, you're, if your array is just the numbers 1 through 10, it will yield 1, 2, 3. Then it will yield 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So it sort of moves one at a time, but yielding n at a time in, in an array. Um, there's reverse each, which is kind of what it sounds like. Um, and that's just for if, it, I mean, obviously you can say dot reverse dot each, but having a reverse each um, makes it more possible to implement it more efficiently and, and so forth. And a, a bunch of ones involving minimum and maximum values. So. There's quite a bit. Oh, yeah, cycle, the second one here. Cycle will iterate through a collection forever. 
And I know there's a use case somewhere. Um, I can't remember it, but yeah, I mean, it basically will just kind of keep going through it. So, I mean, you can actually use that as a kind of, you know, like zip operation gone mad and so forth. CPU simulator. What's that? A CPU simulator. Yeah, right. That's right. Oops. All right. A little bit about enumerators. The reason I, I'm, I'm going to dwell a bit on, on this topic because I think, again, kind of playing the percentages, you know, some of you have probably looked, how many of you have, have looked at in some depth at enumerators? Okay, so my surmisal is probably correct then that most of you haven't, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, enumerators are kind of there that you can actually require enumerator in 1.8 and play with enumerators. They are there kind of for free in 1.9. And one of the reasons I want to talk about them is that I've spent a fair amount of time getting my head into them, and I thought it might be just good to give you a head start on that process. I, I mean, I, they make sense. I, I personally don't find them to be the simplest thing in Ruby by any means. Um, an enumerator is an object that, first of all, it is enumerable, meaning it, it, the enumerator class mixes in enumerable. It's actually the enumerable enumerator class. So enumerators are enumerable, which means they have all that bundle of methods that comes from the enumerable module. Um, select, map, um, each, reject, inject, and so on. Um, and every enumerator, as befits an enumerable object, every enumerator has an each method, since all of this other stuff, the select and inject and so on, is built on top of the iteration through the each method. The difference or the, the sort of thing about enumerators is that their each method is actually um, a, another method, well, it may be each or it may be some other method, from another object. In other words, enumerators to, to enumerate or to iterate through, the, through their own each, they actually kind of siphon the iteration values from a method on another object. And that's why I call them somewhat parasitical. Um, and as for the efficiency, we'll kind of see that play out as, as we look at some examples. Um, but here, okay, here's a, a more mod slightly more modern deck of cards. I mean, it's very similar, but we have initialize. Essentially, initialize just puts like, you know, two of hearts, three of hearts, four of hearts, the, the actual strings. I'm just saving 52 strings, basically, the, the something of something. Um, I'm not even really bothering with card objects or anything. And then I, I flatten that array and I shuffle it. And then here's my, my deal method. I think it's not identical to the 1.0 example, but it's basically the same idea. I have a, a, a hand, or I'm dealing a hand, right? So I, um, I will yield, I'll yield each card as I go through um, if there's a block, and in, whether there's a block or not, I will store the card in the hand array, and then I return the hand array. So if I say deal three, for example, I'll get an array of three cards, and the, the cards array, the, I'm actually popping them off the end, so the, the cards array will be, will be shortened by, by n. Um, and now why is it n equals card size? That's, you don't usually deal the whole deck. Well, I guess you could if you capture them in the block. Anyway, it's unlikely, but, uh, okay. On the left, you see what you, you see the cards, um, code. That's the same code. Okay. Now here in, on the right, I create a new deck. So it's going to have that cards array, you know, two of hearts, three of hearts, and so on. Um, and then I'm going to create an enumerator. And this is uh, in that second line where it says E equals deck, that's my deck cards, deck enum, dot enum for deal. Now what I'm saying is I want an enumerator object that whose idea of each, in other words, the, the idea of how this enumerator object is going to iterate is basically to take values from the deal method of the deck of cards. So for instance, now equipped with that enumerator, I can say, for example, hearts equals E, and E is the enumerator, E.select card, 
card matches hearts, a kind of brute force way to find hearts, right? And then if I print them out, I get all the hearts that are in the deck. So the enumerator, when I say e.select, what it does, well, maybe this is why I did the whole card, the whole deck, um, what it does is it, it knows that it's kind of hooked into, it's like you're sort of hooking up the enumerator to a particular method on the object. The method in this case is deal. And the enumerator, the, the each up method of the enumerator is hooked into the deal method of the deck. So when, when you trigger any kind of iteration on the enumerator, what you're really doing is you're dealing the deck. Behind the scenes, you're, the enumerator is actually dealing from this deck. So selecting from the enumerator ends up being as if I had selected from, um, from the deal operation on the deck. So again, here, if I say deck, it's very similar, but deck enum for deal, and then I throw another argument at it, five. It's, what that's going to do is it's going to pass that five through to the deal method. So what happens is when I say to the enumerator royals, I mean, this is kind of, you know, it's, they're random since the deck is shuffled. It, you know, it's not going to be the queen of hearts and the jack of spades every time. But I say royals equals E dot select card, card matches J, Q, K, A. And here, the enumerator's job is to deal me five cards. In other words, it knows that its each method is hooked up to not only to the deal method, but specifically to the deal method with an argument of five. Now, just a few, I mean, some of this is just kind of a little bit sort of reference, but uh, there's several ways to create enumerators. So really, the third thing on this list is, is the most important one. Um, in 1.9, when you call certain methods on enumerables, like array.map, uh, each, um, select, a couple of others, I think, you get back an enumerator. Now, in the past, when you called map without, without I should say without a block, right? When you called map without a block, you would basically get back the, a, a kind of neutral mapping. It would basically be like dupe. You'd get back another array that just map the elements in your array to themselves. If you did each without a block, you would get your actual array. But actually, each always returned the receiver. Nowadays, if you say, um, for example, actually, sorry, I don't have an exact example of that. But if you just say like some array dot map, you'll get an enumerator. Um, and again, just a couple of other examples. Um, of the kinds of things you can do with enumerators. The main thing is just that the enumerator kind of carries around the knowledge of another method on, an, uh, on another object, or a method on another object, that, that it actually kind of proxies or represents. So here, if I've got days, right, Sunday through Saturday, days enum for map. That means give me an enumerator on the map method of my array days. It returns an enumerator. And now, if I say e dot each day day upcase, I get a mapping of the original array to the upcase values. If you just looked from that line down and you just saw each, you know, you'd think, well, that shouldn't actually return a mapped array, you know, because each basically involves side effects. I'm not actually doing anything in the blocks. If you looked at that, you'd say, wait, that's not an each, that's a map. And it is a map because the each for this enumerator is hooked up to the map method for that array. Oh, sorry, yeah, here's my examples without a block. If you just say days, again, using the array, days.each, days.map, and so on, you now get, or now meaning in one point, you will actually get enumerators back. Now, <clears throat> why do all this? Um, partly, it's, um, you know, why, why return enumerators it, if you're going to do things without a block? It's partly because it's kind of unused space. Um, most of the time you wouldn't say just like array.map or array.each, kind of wouldn't serve much purpose. Um, you can also, it, since if map without a block returns an enumerator, you can chain enumerators. You can, you can do another enumerator on that. Um, and also for efficiency reasons, um, Enumerators create fewer intermediate objects. 
So again, just about a little example of chaining. If you say um, select, okay, days.select, now that's going to return an enumerator. If I stopped right there, I'd get an enumerator. But I say days select dot with index. What that's going to do, with index is, a, is an enumerator method, and that's going to cause two um, objects to be yielded to my block on each iteration. And you can see down there, basically I say select, and then I kind of, I think of it as kind of laundering it through the with index. And so instead of just giving me a day, the days to select from, it gives me the day and the index into the array. I mean, why I would want all the days that are indexed more than three, well, whatever. It's a kind of you know, non-example. But, but that's the thing. When you, when you start to chain iterators, you see you know, a little bit of the, the, the power of them. Um, Oh, this is just a, a cons example. If you do, um, it's actually, it, it's, it's pretty kind of thick and fast. But basically, if you, when you do that each cons to operation, again, I'm going to get kind of pairs walking through the array. So Sunday, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday. The way I did just display that is using the 2A or 2 array method, which is a good way just to get a kind of dump of what the enumerator thinks it's going to do when you ask it to do something. So weekends is twos.select. And, and from, the, from the pairs that are yielded to me, the Sunday, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, I select all the ones that have either Saturday or Sunday. Of course, since Saturday and Sunday are at opposite ends of the array, ironically, I don't actually get the weekend. I really just get the sort of half weekends. Um, but basically what I'm doing there, again, I'm, I'm saying that the object twos is an, is an enumerator on the each cons method. So now, it's kind of like pre-cooking pre something. It's like when I do an each on this, it's alre it already knows to lump the things into twos. In other words, it's that, that each, it's not just going to walk through a, a collection. It's going to walk through a collection based on a particular method on that collection. And there's, I'm actually going to going to gallop a little bit through some of these because um, they're, you know, they're kind of embellishments on what I've been saying. And you certainly can, can get these slides. Um, actually, yeah, I want to get to the fun stuff. I mean, when you, if you're interested in, in looking at some of this more, you can certainly get these slides. But, but just a couple of what I think are kind of fun enumerator curiosities. Um, one of them is if I have st all right, an, an array of state abbreviations, New Jersey, NJ, New York, and so on. Now, just do a regular select. I just want the ones whose abbreviations start with N. So select state, abra, right, the ones that, that match N or beginning N. Now, if I say in sort of the third stanza there, if I say, um, oh, sorry, one thing I wanted to point out here, and this is another kind of tidbit that you might find useful. In 1.9, when you do a select operation on a hash, it returns a hash. In 1.8, it returns an array. 1.9, it returns a hash. That's just a kind of refinement of that method that's, that's happened. So in the third little bit, when I say I want an enumerator for select, and then I run an each on that, so I say e dot each state abbreviation, abbreviation matches n. And there, again, it's sort of like a kind of, uh, a kind of cryptic each, right? If you just look at the each, you, you'd be like, why is it? Why is it only returning two things? You know, like why, why is it using select logic if it's each? The reason is it's an each that's sort of hardwired to the select method um, for this for this enumerator. The last example is a little convoluted, so um, yeah, and that's similar to what I did before, where an each again an each returns a, a mapping. One thing I another one that I find kind of amusing is. If I do an enumerate, I have my days array. If I do an enumerator for map bang, right? Map bang changes the thing in place. So again, if you just looked at the third line, you know, e each day, day dot upcase, you know, it looks kind of odd, but not. Um, I mean, you could sort of say, okay, it's doing a mapping. It must be an enumerator. 
But here, because it's, it, the enumerator is, is hooked into map bang, when I do the each through the enumerator, it actually performs the in-place changes on the objects in the array. So I consider that the stealth bang. Um, you know, it's like you kind of have to know it's there or you're, or you're uh, in trouble. I would say with enumerators, I mean, again, the, you know, there's some, some more there if you're interested in kind of the, the techniques and the technical stuff. But the bottom line with enumerators is they're kind of, they're, they are kind of weird and you sort of have to accept as an axiom what they do and then let them kind of talk to you, so to speak. I mean, they're, they're unlike, to me, the, you know, editorializing, unlike iterators, enumerators feel very kind of engineered. That's just a dumb way to put it. But I mean, iterators, there's a certain kind of organic, like you have an array and you go through it one at a time. You know, that kind of, everything sort of flows from that. Enumerators are clearly kind of, um, you know, kind of the next elaboration of that. An enumerator, again, it's just an object, but it's an object with this kind of strange relation to another object. It's like, you know, I, I need an each, You've got a select. I'm going to use your select as my each. I mean that that's a, a like I say a kind of new embellishment on it. Um, but do you know as as you look at some of this stuff and look at 1.9 and so on, you'll you know you'll see more of this and a lot of it's also in, a bit in flux. But uh, but still it's it's interesting. All right, basic object. Now. Basic object is a new thing in 1.9, and it's very similar to, and I think owes some, perhaps of its existence, to Jim Wyrick's blank slate class. And the idea of the blank slate class, and correct me if I misrepresent this, but the idea of the blank slate class in part um, is that there are times when you want an object that that has essentially no methods. I mean, it might have the absolute bare kind of survival kit of methods, like underscore, underscore, sand, or whatever. Um, and the reason you might want to do that is you might want to involve your objects in the uh, development of, let's say, a, a DSL, a domain-specific language, where you want the person using this language to be able to send pretty much any meth message to this object and have the object not understand it. Now, why would you want to do that? Because then you can intercept it with method missing. You can use the name of the method to do something useful. If the object already has a bunch of methods, and you know, kind of natively, Ruby objects actually have quite a few, then it becomes harder. You know, the, the likelihood of a kind of a name clash that somebody will come up with a method that exists is, is greater. So basic object. In Ruby 1.9, um, if you well to start with, if you ask for the ancestors of any class, leaving out read line, which is only there because of IRB, I have string comparable object kernel, and then at the very top of the hierarchy, basic object. So it's been planted at the very top of the object tree. Um, it doesn't mix in kernel. It doesn't mix in anything. It, it's now as of 1.9, basic object is kind of the, the top. Thing, and if you say, you know, okay, basic objects, basic object, what are your methods? Now that's interesting because instance methods isn't one of its. Oh no, yeah, hmm. That's probably. What's that? Oh yeah, right. No, that's right. Yeah, right. It wouldn't show. Yeah, thank you. Um, so right. So basically. I, I want to know its instance methods, right? And you can see there's very few of them. I mean, it is kind of just the, the survival kit, kind of. Um, and like if I ask down there in Ruby 1.9, if I, oh, this is by the way, is IRB 1.9, basically. If, if I ask for its object ID, it doesn't even know that, right? It doesn't even have that. Um, I love the, the Heisenblank object where in IRB, you try to create a new basic object and it can't even show you the string representation of it because there's no, it does create it, but it can't, there's no inspect method. So IRB gives you this error. Um, and I like that. And again, the, you know, the sort of why of this um, is, you know, partly like, well, Jim, you, I don't remember if you built blank slate for builder or 
around the same time or whatever, but basically the, the kind, probably the most well-known use of the blank slate class, and therefore, you know, I mentioned that in the same breath with basic object because it's very much the same thing, but the main, um, the, the best known use of it is in the builder class where in, in um, building XML templates, and again, this is by Jim, if you say, you know, you have your, your XML builder object and you say X dot name, for example, it creates a name element, a name tag as part of its output stream. Um, and then you can you can nest other you know x x or x dot person and then inside a, a block for that x dot first name and so on. So if you come up you know if you, if you want XML elements that happen to be named things like you know put s or object ID or something, you have to have an object that doesn't already have those names um, claimed. So so blank slate is now uh, I mean. Uh, Basic object is, as I say, very similar to blank slate and is now part of the, uh, the language. All right. Question? Yes. That's not in the inheritance hierarchy, is it? Like, it's not before object? Um, yes, it's before everything. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's before kernel, even. But I mean, is object inherited from basic object? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, God. Well, Thing that gets where? Where do you, you go back? Yeah, right there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that. You know what that is? That's. that's the, I think is that the unary, unary negative. I think that's the unary negative. That's almost reason enough to use one not. Yeah, right. Also enough not equals. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. That's the un, the unary negation. Right. All right, moving on. Um, the lambda literal constructor. How many of you like the lambda literal constructor? Ugh. No, never mind. I don't mean to be. I mean, there's been a lot of. It's it's been a somewhat sort of Sucks. hot potato, <laughs> um, and we we groan about it on IRC a lot and so on. That thing you see there. And all right, you know, I'm stacking the deck a little. I, you know, instead of an example, I just show you the line noise, you know, like as if that proves anything. It doesn't really. I happen to not like this. And I know, you know, most of the time people say, well, it's, you know, similar to this in another language or whatever, which is actually an argument that almost never carries that much weight just on its own with me. But, um, but I don't know. I, I, what in the in the parentheses? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason the reason for it is that it gives you. I put this kind of tersely here, but yeah, it gives you method argument syntax, meaning you, what you you can do things like optional arguments, which you can't in the pipes in the block <laughs> syntax. So this is all kind of the on the search for a way to have anonymous functions that use method argument semantics instead of block argument semantics. So, all right, what's, do you like, well, but you know, the thing is, the, the reason it's necessary, if it is, is the problem with, um, and actually I wanted to switch to some live little IRB stuff to show you some of this uh, block parameter things, which I think I do have time for. So I'll, I'll actually kind of include this in it. Tell me if you, are you seeing, yes, you're seeing, yeah. How's that? Still small, okay, wait, hang on. Is that good? Can you see it? Maybe for the benefit of the client, yeah. Yeah, bigger still. <laughs> Old eyes. There you go. All right. <laughs> the heavy artillery. Now, let me just get maximum width going here. Yeah, I wanted to show you actually to kind of switch into demo mode for some of this stuff, which um, can include the. Now, I, I just updated my 
subversion of this today. So since it's always changing, I probably was stupid because it may do things differently from what I'm expecting. But anyway, this is a, a, a 1.9 R IRB session. Um, and it should be, which one is the one that shows you, um, was it Ruby release? Isn't there one that, no. Well, anyway, it's today-ish. Oh, well, um, okay, so for example, um, oh, whoops, there we go. So what is it? Ah, okay. Right, nice and fresh. All right, so probably too fresh. All right, so for example, um, yeah, the reason, you know, you have this lambda thing. So if I say like f equals stab, you know, a, b equals one, and we'll just evaluate that to b. See, now I can say f call three, and that will give me one, presumably f call three, four, and so on. So yeah, that gives me optional arguments. Now, the reason, hello. What do you need to do? Oh, you're, this is like font policing. Go away. <laughs> All, right. All right. So, um, so right. The reason that this is necessary for those of you who haven't followed the the uh, discussions over over the years, literally, is if you have a block, like you know, you go one, two, three, blah, each. Um, if I want, this is not a, it's whatever, just look at the block. Don't worry about what the thing is. If I say um, A, oh, actually, let me do it this way. If I, if I do the normal, you know, lambda, if I say A, B equals 1, B, if I do it with the block, the problem is that the parser can't tell that that second pipe is not an OR. So it might be b equals one or something, right? Uh, the bitwise or whatever it is, right? Sorry. Bang bitwise. Oh yeah, right. Well, that's one possibility, <laughs> but I think. The other one is the stabby operator. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the other way to get around it is, that, but I, I'm a little bit out of date. But I think a few weeks ago, didn't Eric Mahuran, um submit a patch that made this work? I think that maybe. It also seems impossible to write a parser that will do it because there is going to be an end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's it, there's a lot of talk about this, and it, it, the most recent wave of talk started as some objections or difficulties with this, the lambda stab thing, um, and kind of went into talking about uh, alternatives. And I think there may, might have been a patch that worked or was kind of getting to the point of working, which which I would actually like because I don't want to have to use the stab thing. I, it, I don't know that I've had that many um, occasions to need this kind of, but actually, I mean, like if you're doing a define method operation using a, a proc, it's nice if the proc can have method argument semantics since the point, you know, you're using it to create a method. So I agree with Matt that it, it's an important thing to be able to do. I just wanted to show you a couple of other things about 1.9 block, um, arguments. Now, one of the most, actually, it, let's go back to 1.8 for a minute. One of the most sort of, you know, famous or infamous things about Ruby that people come across is like if I say A equals 1, and then I say, and this is 1.8, right? One, one, two, three, four each, A, put S. I mean, it doesn't matter what happens in the block, in the body of the block, right? So basically, for, for A in 1, 2, 3, 4, put S high. So it prints high four times. It returns my original, you know, the receiver. That's what each does, basically. But then I have A equal to 4, right? In other words, the, the A that exists prior to the block is the same as the A in the block parameter list. And basically, the, the, the logic behind it or the, the rule behind it is that blocks use assignment semantics, that you're saying A equals when you put it between the pipes. Um, 
I am one of two people that I know of who don't think that's bad. The other is Guy Deku. So I'm in good company, but uh, yeah, are there others? Who, yeah, I mean, I always thought of you know not doing this as kind of a solution in search of a problem, but I'm definitely in the minority. I mean, over the years, Matz has said he thinks this is the worst mistake he made in designing Ruby, and you know, whatever. Anyway, I don't. However, time moves on, and now we're back in, or we're forward in 1.9. And if we say um, a equals one, and then we go like this, and then we examine a, we find that a is in fact still one. Now, if we do this, however, if we say each x, and again, these are just you know dinky examples to, to make the point, but if in the block I say you know a equals x times 10, now, because it's not a block parameter, it now is the A from the outer scope. And that's as it should be. I mean, you, you want to be able to write a closure on the local environment, right? So to do that, what's that? What you just showed, those concepts are there. Can you read it again now? They're what? Putting a block, block parameter versus assigning, like that, that's just a good Block parameter is just a shortcut for. It, it was, yeah, up to and including 1.8. It no longer is. I mean, right now, it, now it creates a new A. Now let's say you wanted. Let's make A one again. Let's say you happen to use the variable A, but you're not sure whether you have an A in the local scope, and you don't want to risk clobbering it. But it's not really a block parameter because you only need one and you've already got x. If you put a semicolon in the parameter list, anything to the right of the semicolon, will it, it's, not, it's not a block parameter in the sense it's not going to be bound to anything that gets yielded. It's just a list of local variables. Is it really that hard to not use? I don't know. I, I'm the messenger. <laughs> I know. I, like I said, I don't. I never had this. I also feel like if you, if you have to put, you know, if you don't know what your local variable is, then how will you know that it's a good idea to protect it? I don't know. I mean, yeah. So now if I do this, the a in the block obviously got changed, but the a outside the block didn't because I explicitly said. I want a protected A inside this block. So that's you know that's kind of the the change, and it's um, it it's been it's been demanded over the years by a lot of people. So like I said, it's not my thing. You know, I I don't really mind it the way it was. I kind of liked it. I I do understand going back to the the stabby lambda thing. I do understand the need for some way to do anonymous functions with method argument semantics. I mean, that, that I think it, we do need in, in one version or another. I kind of root for it not to be that kind of line noisy one. Um, all right, well, we're getting, we're getting close to the end. I just wanted to quickly talk about a few things, and some of them have probably emerged from, from my talk anyway. But you know, just if I could wave the magic wand, what would I change? Um, well, guess what? <laughs> I mean, that's a little bit kind of it's a cheap shot because, you know, I, like I said, I know there's a reason for it, and I, I don't, I haven't written the patch that makes it unnecessary, so I can't really, you know, I can't really complain too much. But um, it's, the, the thing is, though, it's actually supposed to look like a lambda character. This is part of the problem. It, Matt said it's a lambda character turned 45 degrees or something. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean. Well, you've got to provide a suggestion if you're going to critique the current. What make claims about parsers that are not? Necessary. What I would probably well, or what I would probably do is change the is use the lambda keyword, which is I know it's more characters, but I you know I actually, yeah I actually like keyword and we we have like lambda proc proc new we have ones to spare yes. What do you, how do you feel about using that without a name at all? Without a method name? Return. Yeah, that was something Dave Thomas brought up, um, I think at RubyConf in San Diego a few years ago. The idea of just doing like 
def and then an argument list, and that would just be an anonymous function. I don't know what happened to that. I mean, that got a well-deserved round of applause when he <laughs> suggested it, and I don't know whether there's been any, I, I mean, I have to assume that Matt's doesn't want to do it. I don't remember if there's, there'd been any, you know, much talk about it. Um, so, right, this thing, it always looks like an arrow, no matter what. All right, again, I'm, I'm just taking cheap shots here because I, because I have the stage. So, I, who was I talking with last night about, or a couple nights ago about inject and reduce? I like inject, you know, that we have enough. Inject does have kind of a cult following. In 1.9, you can use the word reduce instead. Um, get rid of class variables. This is fun. I get to say all the stuff I want to Of course, we're not going to get rid of class variables. I've always hated them. And I've never hesitated to say so. Um, block awareness to enumerate. That was from actually one of the slides that I kind of skipped over, but I, I'm not going to go into that a, a great deal. But uh, Now, this is one. Um, Jim, you talked briefly the other day about the, the, the fluent style with the dots and so on, right? Weren't you talking about in... in um, in connection with FlexMock. And it's now, I think, kind of in the name of fluent style, it's now possible to put a dot on the next line. So put as ABC, carriage return, dot upcase. And I really, I have to say, I really don't like that. I, it just, it, I feel like when I get to the end of a line, I should kind of know, like that line doesn't evaluate to ABC. It's not like there's some default object that that dot will apply to, but now there kind of is, and I I don't know I I really yeah. don't. Yeah. Doesn't plus already do that though? Doesn't Maybe what? Plus. So if I have a string, I can put the plus on the next line. The dot doesn't seem much worse. Are you sure about it? Thoughts now. I don't think so. I think no. It I think the plus will be interpreted as a unary plus. You put it on the end of the line. What's the verdict? Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, no, this one is pretty much unto itself. I also like where you could do hashes with commas. That's gone. I, it was just quick to, you know, an IRB like one, two, three, four, make a hash. Can't do that anymore in 1.9. Symbols have become kind of string like. Um, you can sort them, and I, maybe you could sort them before, I can't remember, but. Um, you can upcase them and stuff. I don't know. There's kind of creeping stringism among symbols, and um, I would, you know, that's again. This is all just kind of, you know, editorializing. But I, I that to me is a bit of a, a non-great thing. Um, How is magically not going to work in IRB? It doesn't. That's a, it's out and out doesn't. Okay. Yeah. Um, right, because IRB right does does the end of line. Um, <coughs> So anyway, that's just some of my, my little pros and cons. But my real conclusion is that I really love Ruby, and I'm going to keep loving it. And um, I hope you do, too. And like I said, if, you, if there's any things in here that you want to go back to or look at you know, in more depth, they'll, they'll be available somewhere. And that's about it. Thank you very much.